So right now we are going to begin our drug development roundtable, and it is going to be moderated by Dr. Marsha Felker with the Riley Hospital for Children at IU Health. So Dr. Felker, I will let you take over. Wonderful. Thank you, Nicole. Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I think as we all know, um, the drug de development process is very important to us and all of our patients and um, all the people affected with SMA as we always want to look for better treatments and we want to make sure that um, things are developed safely um, and taking into consideration the needs of patients um, um, especially. Um, so um, again, I'm Marcia Felker. I'm going to let everyone go around and introduce themselves for this talk. Um, Gabrielle, would you mind going first? Hi, my name is Gabrielle. Um, I'm 18 years old and I go to the University of Michigan. I think Gabrielle froze. We'll let we'll get let her computer catch up. Oh, Gabrielle, we heard you went to the University of something and then it froze. Could you try that again? My name is Gabrielle, and I go to the University of Rural and I study music. Uh, I think. Um, is everyone else experiencing this? There's just a little bit slowness in the internet connection. So we did hear you went to the University of Louisville and just one more time so everyone gets to know you a little bit. Could you share what you're studying again? Okay. I think I'm back now. Okay. Yay, good. <laughs> um, let's try this again. I'm Gabrielle Runyon. I'm 18 years old. I go to the University of Louisville and I study music therapy. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. Dr. Farwell, would you please go next? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Wilden Farwell. I'm the global medical uh, head of neuromuscular at Biogen. I led the clinical development program for uh, Spinraza and now lead medical affairs for neuromuscular at Biogen. And Dr. Lakotia. I, I just talked for an hour. I'm Arpita Lakotia. I am a child neurologist at uh, University of Louisville Norton Medical Children's Group. Uh, I'm co-director of the MBA clinic uh, there and I run our SMA program. Wonderful, thank you. We had a few, I think a few people added on since, since you spoke, so I'm, I think that was helpful for them, thank you. Um, well, Roundtable team, thank you for being here. Um, I think for some of us, there might be a second or two lag on our responses, so we'll of course do our best not to interrupt each other, um, but that might be unavoidable, we'll see. Um, and then in between, if we could um, have our microphones off just to minimize any background noise for everybody listening, that would be great. Okay. So let's start off. Um, so I have a series of questions, and then of course, if the um, community would like to chat, um, join in with questions too, we'll answer those. Um, so first, uh, Dr. Farwell, let me start with you. Um, why did why does pharma um, decide to look for treatments for a disease like SMA, which is so rare? Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Felker. It's a great question. It, it's one. Uh, where I think SMA is a great uh, example of, of really what is possible uh, these days. You know, uh, a lot of work has gone into uh, understanding the disease, understanding the natural history of spinal muscular atrophy over many years. And then in the 1990s, the gene uh, for spinal muscular atrophy was identified. And, and after that, there uh, started a lot of understand, uh, the protein and understand ways of increasing uh, the amount of protein that uh, is missing in, in patients with uh, SMA. And so it was because of uh, understanding uh, the deficiency, understanding how to increase that amount of protein, understanding the natural history, it really led uh, to the ability of uh, academic groups to begin to do research and then uh, to pharmaceutical companies to expand uh, that research to now where we have three approved therapies in the U.S. Uh, to treat spinal muscular atrophy.
Well, wonderful. Thank you. Um, and certainly we are uh, very grateful for all the research and work that's been done that has led to the development of these fantastic drugs. Um, Dr. Lakodia, so you kind of summarized this, but maybe just for the new people. In your, um, uh, what, what do you think is the importance of having genetic testing um, for patients in order to get, for, in terms of development of SME therapies? So, um, I mean, genetic testing is absolutely important. One, from a standpoint of when in this symposium, when we're talking about SMA, all of us are talking about that 5Q SMA, which is 95% of SMA. But there is 5% of other kinds of SMA, which really won't be amenable to any of these treatments. So I actually have patients um, who have SMARD, where even nurses ask me, why aren't we treating them with Spinraza? Why aren't we giving them gene therapy? And the reason is that even though it's SMA, it's a different kind. And that's what we found out through genetic testing. So one, making sure that you actually have a disease that can be treated by the treatment that you're giving. And then two, um, knowing that SMN2 copy number helps, again, helps with thinking about the prognosis and the long-term outcome just a little bit. It may not be perfect science, but it does help us make uh, get a good sense of what we're expecting. So a person with two copies of SMN2 gene is going to be very much different from someone with four copies of SMN2 gene. We know that clinically. So I think that's why genetic testing is absolutely important. And like someone had asked the question about uh, uh, planning for life and pre planning pregnancy and things like that. Um, having genetic testing, we've got patients who get diagnosed prenatally and then we can start treatment on in week one, as opposed to wait, waiting until people get symptoms. So pre-symptomatic treatment we know is important, but whichever study you look at for any drug, uh, pre-symptomatic treatment is better than uh, waiting until symptoms arrive. So that would be another reason. I agree. I think um, gen the genetic testing is um, essential for everybody in this day and age, so we know exactly what the best treatment options are for them uh, on many levels from a cost perspective, from a treatment perspective. Yes. Um, so Dr. Farrell, let's go back to you. What do you see are some of the biggest challenges in developing drugs for SMA? So when we were uh, developing uh, Spinraza, there were no other therapies uh, available. And although the natural history was well characterized, uh, we still uh, believed uh, that a sham control uh, was necessary to really demonstrate uh, the, uh, the efficacy along with the safety. Um, now that that's been uh, demonstrated, uh, the natural histories continue to be understood. Uh, Later companies uh, have not required uh, placebo or, or sham control. I think going forward, um, it's going to be continue to be a challenge to understanding what is the remaining unmet need, uh, how much of that need uh, can be addressed uh, in combination therapy or with new targets uh, that are being identified. And, and so I think this, uh, type of question is going to be a significant challenge uh, for the field going forward. So we've heard a little bit about some of the challenges and the things that in terms of drug development for um, SMA. Gabrielle, could you tell us um, about how families and patients could get involved in clinical trials for SMA? Um, I know that, um, that I haven't been like that involved. I know I can get more involved. I've been more involved in Rosetta Palm, but just asking your doctor like what's out there and like Dr. Lakoti is my doctor. So she tells me what's out there and really tells me what's going on and what I can get involved in. So really getting involved with your doctors and asking them what you can do to get more involved. Gabrielle, could you also sort of share what your experience was like with um, RISDAPLAM that you said you were involved in? What was that like for you? Um, I started in the early access program before it was approved, and I'm taking it now, and it's been about two or three months that I've been on it. So it's it's a lot different than Spinraza, and that's kind of why I like it, because I had to be sedated to get the spinal injections, and that was a risk because I had breathing problems. So just 
kind of outweighing the benefits and the cost of like what was it to switch and everything um and like hoping that i gained some more milestones through this is So some of the audience members are asking excellent questions. So what kind of concerns or questions do we still have about some of the drugs in the pipeline? Um, Dr. Lakodia, how about, what, do you, what are your thoughts about some of the drugs you spoke about in your previous presentation? Oh, so, so, so many concerns. Uh, so one thing is we don't know what they do, what like for gene therapy, we don't know if it wears off in 15, 20 years, right? No one has that information and no one can predict that. So how long-term is it efficacious is one thing. We don't know any long-term side effects. Will, will we grow like a s extra finger over time? We don't know that. Or will it predispose to malignancy? Certainly, it's like with gene therapy. Um, in general, gene therapies that integrate into your genome, uh, malignancy is a big risk. That's not been seen in the AAV9 therapy. So hopefully that's not a big thing, but we don't know of long-term adverse outcomes with this. Um, and then uh, we also, uh, especially for the one-time therapies, we don't know the long-term efficacy of uh, will we need a second agent or uh, when we talk about redosing down in 10 years, which if you get antibodies, you can't really do that. So um, uh, those would be the big concerns uh, that I would have. Dr. Farwell, how about you? Can you speak to any thoughts you have about drugs in the pipelines and questions that still remain in your mind? Sure. <clears throat> you know, so I think uh, Dr. Cody has uh, touched on, you know, long-term safety, long-term efficacy. I think those, uh, those are uh, remaining uh, questions. I think uh, many of the uh, companies are uh, having long-term extension studies uh, just to try to continue to gather uh, the data to inform uh, the long-term safety and efficacy. Um, you know, Scholar Rock has a different uh, mechanism uh, for uh, its therapy, which is in uh, clinical trials. And so it'll be interesting to see if we can identify some new targets uh, beyond uh, just decimin protein and, and then now with myostatin. So are there additional targets uh, that can be identified to develop uh, therapies for? You know, SMA is still a rare disease and, and it, it's it's um, makes it more challenging to conduct uh, clinical trials and uh, makes it more challenging to, to really understand uh, the remaining unmet needs. So, you know, really having uh, patients and uh, uh, the community participate in registries and participate in other observational studies will really be critical uh, for us to be able to develop the next generation of therapeutics for SMA. Um, so one of the audience members was asking questions and asking us to, to um, expand on the DEVOTE study. Is that something you can comment on, Dr. Farwell? Sure, happy to. So, um, you know, with Spinraza, we uh, moved through clinical development as quickly as possible. We went from first in human to first approval in five years. Um, and then we evaluated uh, the data uh, from the clinical trials along with the safety profile that was being observed uh, in the clinical trials as well as in uh, patients. Uh, and we determined uh, that we had an opportunity uh, to uh, test an even higher uh, dose. Uh, and so we did the preclinical work uh, to demonstrate uh, whether there was any additional known uh, complications. Um, and we initiated uh, the DEVOTE study earlier uh, this year. Uh, and what we're doing in that study is now looking to see will higher doses of Spinraza be able to generate uh, greater efficacy uh, while still maintaining a reasonable uh, safety profile. So uh, we, it's a three uh, part study. Uh, part A uh, evaluated uh, 28 milligram loading dose and 28 milligram uh, maintenance dose. Uh, that part has been completed. We just recently announced that we're now moving into part B, uh, where we will look at a 50 milligram loading dose followed by a 28 milligram uh, maintenance dose. And so we will uh, begin uh, that study now uh, and then uh, have a part C uh, where patients currently on Spinraza uh, would uh, potentially qualify to receive uh, the higher uh, dose regimen and then follow. And so uh, we'll hope, 
collect data over this and then be able to evaluate to see if a higher dose of uh, Spinraza can uh, achieve even greater efficacy with, uh, again, a reasonable safety profile. And uh, for our audience here, um, uh, are you still enrolling any subjects? And what kind of subjects, what are your criteria for your, your subjects? Right, so uh, the Part B of DEVOTE has just uh, started uh, enrolling. Uh, so there are, um, there are patients uh, with both infantile onset SMA, so those are patients most likely to develop or have uh, type 1 SMA. And then there are also opportunities for patients with later onset SMA. So these are patients most likely to develop type 2 or type 3 uh, SMA. So um, there will be more um, uh, opportunities for uh, the infants uh, than uh, for uh, the children. And this, again, is uh, in order to achieve uh, the shortest time in the clinical trial uh, possible. Uh, but uh, a number of sites uh, will begin uh, enrolling here soon. And as Dr. Lakota uh, mentioned in the last presentation, the best source uh, to identify those sites are either through clinicaltrials.gov or through MDA or our similar uh, sites uh, to find uh, clinical trial sites uh, with the DEVOTE study. Dr. Lakodia, there's another question coming from the audience. Um, so it looks like a, um, a gentleman who has been receiving Spinraza since May of 2018. Um, I'm sorry, just jumped on me here. Um, and he's seeing improvements in his lower body strength, um, but he's continuing to be weak in his upper body. And so he's asking, you know, what kind of steps are being taken to try and look for broader distribution of the drugs? And we do know that uh, Spinraza tends to sort of stay closer to the injection site. Um, uh, are you aware of anything in terms, what, what other steps could he be looking for for his future? I mean, um, I don't know if there's anything that can be done from a Spinraza standpoint because it is intrathecal and it's limited by that. But we know from for Rizdiplam, like from early clinical data, that it does have some benefit for bulbar symptoms. So up in the mouth face or motor coordination, all of that. So the idea is that with Rizdiplam, you might see more of a benefit, especially for someone who's been seeing benefit just in the lowers, but not in the uppers. It may be worthwhile to even uh, think about Rizdiplam. Yeah, well, we're getting questions from people who are interested about the process of switching from Spinraza to Rizdiplam. Can you tell us from your perspective how that went and how that felt for you? Um, for me, the decision was, it was, I mean, it was a hard decision to um, decide because I was seeing a lot of improvements with Spinraza. I didn't want to stop seeing improvements, but because I had to be put under and have anesthesia, anesthesia, and everything that was a problem and a risk too because I have asthma and breathing problems. So just like outweighing the costs and the benefits of it and just like thinking about yourself and like do you want if you're gonna see more improvements on that Spinraza or Resist Clam and just like yeah just thinking about like if I mean you take Risk the Plam every day but you get the injections every so often with Spinraza. So just I mean that was a big step for me like not having to get that in my spine and everything and getting put under so it seemed easier to just take the liquid everywhere people uh so there's other questions if you wouldn't mind sharing um they're wondering what your improvements were with spinraza and how you feel very preliminarily of course how risdiplam is doing for you um for spinraza i saw more upper body strength um, improvement so I could open like jars of like big old jars of mayonnaise or something like that and those kind of jars and then I could open like soy sauce packets which I couldn't do before and I could open the refrigerator and just like more upper body strength and all that but re with Rosetta Palm I've seen more hand strength because I could like the syringe I couldn't squeeze the liquid out but now I can squeeze the liquid out so it's it's mostly in my arms and my upper body that I've seen improvements. So it sounds like a lot of changes that have given you a little bit more independence. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Must feel great. That's wonderful. 
Um, well, Dr. Lakodia, as Gabrielle's doctor, could you sort of share the, um, how you're seeing how the process is going for patients switching from spin Spinraza to Ristaplan? Uh, yeah. Uh, so for Gabrielle, she was our only uh, patient in expanded access, and she actually got approved for that like on the last day, right before um, Rizoplam got FDA approvals. It was kind of neat. Um, uh, the process overall has been fairly straightforward, but again, having that discussion uh, with the patient, because even now when I talk to patients, I give them, I, we talk about all the options that are there. Um, that are, If it's a little kid, we talk about gene therapy, along with the other two. If it's an older patient, we talk about the two options and just talk about the risk and benefit and what I think uh, might be a challenge for them versus what might be more beneficial for them. Um, and then kind of let them decide. We obviously have more uh, longer term data for Spinraza. And I think Gab Gabrielle and I had, like we had that discussion also that we know what it does long term. Whereas Ristiplan, we only have a shorter period of data. We know that it works, but we don't know what the long-term side effects are, especially if it's a male uh, with that animal studies showing uh, the decreased spermatogenesis. Um, infertility can be an issue in talking about sperm banking and things like that uh, becomes important. Uh, but then, uh, like Gabrielle said, weighing risk and benefit in each individual case um, with scoliosis and needing sedation and needing IR for Spinraza versus taking a daily oral medicine, uh, uh, deciding what works for the patient and the family. Uh, but overall, our transitions have been not bad. I would say similarly for my patients, we've been fortunate. We've been able to transition a few people over without too much um, difficulty with insurance companies, which is, of course, always um, an, an issue. <laughs> um, let's see here. So here's another, here's another question for everyone, if everyone could comment. What things are you looking for on the horizon? Like, what are you most excited about in terms of the, the future for SMA therapy? Um, Dr. Farwell, we haven't let you talk in a minute. How about you first? Yeah, this is um, something we think a lot about at Biogen because, uh, you know, it's really uh, important. We are very interested and committed uh, to SMA. Uh, we have um, a lot of work uh, going on with uh, Spinraza, obviously, to uh, see if higher doses are more effective, to see if uh, Spinraza can be effective in patients who receives Olgenzima, that's the response study. Um, you know, we're very interested in, in identifying a biomarker, trying to understand can, uh, can there be a way to know whether a patient's uh, treatment is optimized on one therapy or uh, whether uh, they need a different uh, therapy to optimize uh, treatment. If we're waiting to see if a patient gains motor function by the time they haven't, it's too late because that motor function uh, may be lost. Uh, and so, you know, trying to think about how can we uh, better evaluate uh, these medicines for optimal uh, treatment is something we're quite interested in. And then, you know, looking uh, to see if we can optimize the available uh, mechanisms, see if we can identify new targets. Uh, these are uh, examples of the work uh, that we're doing at Biogen, thinking about the future. Gabrielle, could you share what, it, what things are you excited for in the future for SMA? Um, I'm excited to, like you said, gain more attention and um, just the possibilities of more treatments and more things that are effective. I mean, Spinraza and Rosidopalm are effective now. And just the possibility, like in my lifetime, how many treatments have already come out? Like when I was born, I 18 years ago, there were like, they said that there was no hope for me and that I wouldn't be alive to this day. So just the, and I never saw, thought that I would see treatments for SMA in my lifetime or anything like that. So just the possibilities that I think they're endless. So. I love your positivity and I just love that we have all of these great treatments to offer people now. It's just so inspirational. Oh, Dr. Dr. Lakoria, how about you? <laughs> So I'm actually very excited to see what the natural history is now with all the treatments that are out there that we're treating pre-symptomatic kids even. Um, I'm looking forward to see what uh, combination therapy data shows. Um, and then the third thing would be 
hoping that the cost comes down for some of these treatments. So some of it is not sustainable in the long term, so I'm hopeful. That's one thing that I'm, as a clinician, I'm really hopeful for. Dr. Farwell, how about, could you chime in on your perspectives on the costs of developing um, these SMA treatments and what do you think about is for society as a whole in terms of managing costs versus and providing good treatment? It's a tough yeah. one. Well, you know, this is obviously a, a question that we, we hear a lot and it, it's absolutely uh, one that, uh, uh, that we're working on, you know, uh, Drug development is expensive. Uh, it is something uh, that takes uh, companies a long uh, period of time working with uh, folks all around the world. And, and you know, uh, there's been a lot of investment uh, over many years in research and development. Um, you know, Biogen is committed uh, to uh, continuing to work with uh, the community. We have a program in the U.S. Uh, that. Um, you know, works with uh, uh, patients and providers to make sure that patients have access uh, and uh, work with uh, providers uh, on uh, that access and provide uh, uh, services uh, to patients who, who need access. And, you know, we're uh, extending the reach of Spinraza around the world now. We, we have um, approvals and access in over 50 uh, different countries, you know, over 11,000 patients uh, now are receiving Spinraza. Um, I do, uh, you know, continue to uh, work with our team to figure out additional ways to, uh, to think about the price and the cost and how we can bring uh, additional uh, value. And that's why we continue to fund uh, work in SMA, continuing to look for uh, new therapies and new uh, ways of uh, treating uh, patients. So um, it is a, uh, an issue that we're committed to working with the community to, to find uh, solutions for. Wonderful, thank you for that. I know it's um, a difficult subject. Uh, we, all wanna, we all wanna do our best. Um, there's been some great input from the audience. Um, so um, one person posted that they are most looking forward to having the words number one genetic killer of type one removed from all future slideshows in the future. And I, I think that's great. I, I agree. I agree. I should take that out of my slideshow. My apologies. Um, let's see. Other questions that we have. So Dr. Lakodia, perhaps for you here. So is visible mus muscle growth normal with Spinraza? Um, this, this patient is, this person is having vis visual growth in several leg muscles. Um, and so they're, I think they're wondering if that's a typical thing that you see when people get Spinraza. That is not something that I know of or that I've seen personally in my patients. And certainly patients who are treated earlier on, we can expect to see less atrophy, but I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I, I, Dr. Lakoti and I both treat primarily children, um, but um, yeah, I would agree in my practice as well. Dr. Farwell, are you familiar with anything like that? Um, so we, we didn't uh, measure uh, muscle growth per se in the clinical trials, but I will say that um, if you look at the infants treated in a pre-symptomatic period or soon after symptom onset, such as in the nurture study, you do see um, larger uh, muscle uh, than in uh, patients who were treated uh, longer after uh, disease onset. Um, and so I think it's just uh, speaking to, you know, the potential opportunity, uh, you know, is greater uh, to treat as soon as possible after a diagnosis. And, and um, um, you know, I think also with Spinraza, you know, it is a drug administered uh, to the CNS. And so, you know, I think uh, it uh, potentially uh, reflects uh, just the importance of really uh, the treatment uh, on the alpha motor neuron, the, the disease uh, within uh, the motor neuron itself. I would agree if I, um, I think any side of muscle growth um, with SMA is going to be a, a favorable sign. 
um, another older patient, an old, older person with SMA, um, is asking whether or not there's been reporting on improved or increased heart rate or breathing with any of the medicines. Um, and so certainly improved respiratory function has been mentioned. Gabrielle, let me get from your perspective. Do you think um, that being treated with Nusinersen has helped you in, feel, in terms of your breathing, how it feels or how it's going? Um, I think it's helped with my breathing. I don't know about heart or anything like that. I think it's definitely helped with my breathing and it's gotten better. Like I can take more fuller deep breaths than I could before. Dr. Claudia, I know that uh, some of my patients are reporting just less um, time in hospital with uh, respiratory infections. Um, so we're presuming that that's also because of improvement in breathing. Would that be similar with your practice as well? Yes, yeah. Um, absolutely, and the less, like, lesser need for yeah, any hospitalizations or uh, invasive ventilation and things like that. And I don't know about the heart, but I mean, from a GI standpoint, when Spinraza initially came out, I didn't know what to tell patients. I think Gabrielle and I might have had that conversation that I don't know if someone has a G-tube, I don't know if it'll take it out or if it'll allow them to feed independently. But over four years, we've learned that yes, that can happen. Kids who have had NG tubes or G tubes may not need it anymore. And I think expectations of what a drug can do can, can are, are important, but sometimes it's hard to tell, especially early on. One question we have is um, from also from a um, someone who's forty uh, over forty with SMA, um, and so their question is: um, Would any would any of the SMA medicines give a patient the ability to walk for the first time? or at the very least have mobility to sit or use a wheelchair. Um, Dr. Lakoti, how about from your experience, from your knowledge? I think that depends on how old the patient is and how severe their SMA is and what the baseline function is. Um, obviously we expect that in little kids who are specially treated presymptomatically that they'll be able to sit, maybe even stand and walk. That's the whole idea, that's the whole hope. Um, again, I treat kids for the most part, so. Uh, I might not know what it would do for an adult, but I think it would really depend on your, what we call a pre-morbid baseline. So your baseline before um, any treatment is started. Uh, I will say I've been very surprised because I had a somewhat older patient of type, with type 1 SMA who did not have any permanent invasive ventilation. So uh, seven, eight years old, where really minimal motor function. And I was surprised with how much motor function they um, achieved with Spinraza, how much gains they had. Uh, it wasn't like they were sitting up, and that's something that I typically tell uh, patients who are non-ambulatory who are starting on any disease-modifying treatment, that the idea is not to, the, that's not the goal, to have you sit up and walk or stand up and walk. The idea is to stop disease progression. While we try to do that, if things improve otherwise, that's, we'll take it as a bonus, we'll take it, absolutely. So like talking with Gabrielle, when we initially talked about treatment, there was, we want, we know what SMA does over time. The idea is to stop that progression. That's the goal. And if you can open a fridge and jars in the meantime, while we do that, that's, that's perfect. Gabrielle, what are some of the messages um, that you've heard from Dr. Lakodia or other people that have been helpful for you in your course with SMA? Um, kind of exactly what Dr. Lacodia just said, just like stopping the progression of SMA. And we didn't expect for me to, I mean, it was a plus that I gained milestones and could have some gains. But our goal was just to stop the progression because we didn't know, if, since I'm an older patient, we didn't know if I would have any gains or not. If, if, I, if I can share, Gabrielle, she rolled for the first time when she was in for a clinical trial, like pre-starting RISD-Plan clinical trial visit. Yeah, I rolled on my side for the first time and Dr. Lacolia got to witness it. It's kind of like seeing someone's first steps. It's so exciting, it's wonderful. <laughs> Well, Dr. Farwell, from your perspective, what, what uh, other things, uh, is there anything else from a Biogen perspective that you can share that um, in the future that we can look for or thoughts or ideas? Is there anything available for public use? Yeah, so, you know, again, what we're working on um, uh, to see, you know, can the higher dose uh, become uh, uh, possible? Uh, 
looking to see uh, can Spinraza provide additional benefit in patients who received uh, Zolgensima. Uh, we're uh, thinking through uh, just is there opportunity to look at different uh, ways to administer uh, Spinraza. Uh, so that's, um, uh, you know, there's been uh, lots of uh, discussion of, of that and that's something that we're uh, thinking through and, and working on. Um, you know, I mentioned the work on biomarkers to try and identify uh, whether we've uh, maximized the amount of SMN protein production or whether that's something that uh, can still uh, be done more effective. Uh, and then we have the next generation uh, therapies. Uh, we have our, our own uh, next generation uh, antisense oligonucleotide that we're working on, uh, next generation small molecule that we're working on, next generation uh, gene therapy. Uh, we have our own muscle enhancing uh, program. So, you know, there's a lot of work uh, that is going on and, um, you know, just continuing to partner with the community uh, like MDA, uh, like others to, again, as Dr. Lakota mentioned, try to understand the new natural history uh, that is emerging and what is the remaining unmet medical need and how do we design and develop therapies to address that. Uh, you know, once we've maximized SMN protein production, you know, what's next? What do we need to really be uh, working on? So it's so great to hear the progress that Gabrielle uh, is making and others are making, uh, but we know that there's still a lot of work uh, left to do uh, to, to find a cure uh, for SMA, and that's what we're uh, committed to continue working on. It's wonderful to hear um, how patients and clinicians and pharma and everyone can work together to help find um, treatments and cures for this disease. I think we'll finish up this drug roundtable with um, someone who shared, one of the audience members who shared, this is wonderful, 27-year-old daughter, SMA type two, diagnosed at seven months, two months on Rizdaplam, rolled on her side for the first time since she was young, opened a cheese stick and yogurt cup for the first time ever this week. Great. Well, thank you all for participating so much uh, um, in this roundtable, and thank you, audience, for all your excellent questions um, and your time.